Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Stephen Wallman, and he's doing yeoman service at this uh, conference. This is his second panel in three days. Um, Steve is the founder and chief executive of Folio FN Inc., an online brokerage and investment company. He, too, was uh, a commissioner of the SEC, had been a partner at Covington and Burling, and a uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Steve? Thank you. And um, I, I guess I'm supposed to be the striptease here, but uh, I'm uh, actually in an awkward position because I think I was actually put on the panel in order to balance what was going to be perceived as sort of uh, government is too big, we need to make it smaller approach. And the two sets of proposals that we've heard so far are the greatest expansion, I think, in financial regulation I've ever heard today. Um, in terms of the kinds of things that we're asking regulators to do, they're, they're pretty remarkable. And I think we're setting, we have set up uh, regulators to fail. There is no conceivable way that folks could have understood as well as we would have liked the potential debacle that was coming through the 2008-2009 timeframe by looking at it in 2007 and 2006. Let me just do a show of hands here. You're all very sophisticated people. You're lawyers or economists. You thought deeply about this. You care about this. How many people in 2006 and 2007 went entirely to cash knowing that the market was going to go down in 2008? We have three people. How many people didn't do that? OK. Um, and you're all smart. And this is, in part, sort of a market out here. We've got folks who are following this. It can't be more important to you to worry about what government did than to worry about your own money. So presumably, this is something you care actually about. So when you look at that, and you look, and I'll bet some of you are rich enough to have advisors and to have other people who gave you advice, and they presumably wanted to make sure they were making money, and most of those people get paid on an asset-based fee. So they had an interest in making sure that you weren't going to have fewer assets at the end of the day than more assets at the end of the day. So when you look at all that together, an awful lot of really, really smart people either all drink the Kool-Aid or didn't see the train coming down the, t the, the, the tracks or for whatever reason, miss the fact that we were going to be in trouble. Part of that comes from the fact that, in fact, housing prices really didn't go down very much over the preceding, oh, sort of 50 years. Uh, and there were some times when, in fact, they went down a little, but they didn't go down an awful lot. Folks did put together models. And there is a mistake. You know, People do sometimes mistake models for markets and forget the fact that models aren't necessarily completely irrational the way markets can, in fact, sometimes be. But we're in a position where if you look at housing, in fact, generally speaking, it hasn't gone through very, very significant collapses for an extended period of time across all asset categories of housing, from large to small, from commercial to housing that is basically uh, Section 8 type of housing and others. You, you haven't seen a complete disaster across the board. What you've seen have been pockets. You've seen places that were overbuilt that then go through a correction. But to have the entire country go down in terms of housing prices, except for a couple of uh, small places around Washington, which doesn't seem to have gone down, uh, you, you, you generally don't get into the issues of a systemic problem. Let's look at a second thing. The systemic risk here came not, in fact, from a couple of entities that were too large to fail that, in fact, were going to or did, AIG notwithstanding, and we can talk about that in more detail later, uh, but it came from the fact that an awful lot of individuals who would have and should have, in the ordinary case, been quite heterogeneous uh, were not able to pay their bills. And those bills basically were their mortgages for some prime mortgages that were given without a lot of disclosure in many cases and without a lot of understanding on the part of others as to what the potential risks might be, and uh, without enough understanding on the part of, in terms of the marketplace, what happens if you securitize something so that you actually divorce the originators of the mortgages, the folks who in fact have the most knowledge as to whether or not somebody can in fact repay, or the people who are then buying them. Combine that with the fact that we've all bought into an efficient diversification theory, which says, generally speaking, and it's clearly true, if you diversify, you have lower risk than if you don't diversify. And the thought was, if you put together a lot of the different tranches of a lot of these subprime mortgages over time, even though somebody might default, not everyone's going to default at the same time. And if not everyone defaults at the same time, then generally speaking, the security you're owning is probably going to be okay. 
put all that together, and you don't have a central person creating a systemic risk problem. This is not the equivalent of what we saw with long-term capital back in the 1980s, uh, where long-term capital management as a single firm had so much counterparty risk outstanding that people were concerned that should it fail, you would in fact have a systemic risk that would ripple through Wall Street. And in fact, in that instance, the Fed got the various counterparties together in a room and said, we need you all to step up, and we need you all to basically help bail out long-term capital, and they did. And although there were some rumblings and some uh, collapse in some of the markets, it was relatively short-lived and things went on. By the way, one interesting example, of all the party, the counterparties generally that were involved in long-term capital and the folks who were asked to step up, there was one investment bank who did not step up or did not step up to the degree that others thought they should have. Uh, and there were a lot of long memories on Wall Street. Anybody want to care to guess what was the name of that one investment bank that didn't step up? I'll give you, no, I'll give you a hint. It starts with an L. You know? Which is the one investment bank that actually went under where nobody stepped up over the last year? Give you a hint. It starts with an L. So, it, actually, you've got Le Lehman and Bear that both were in interesting positions, and which are the two that basically aren't around anymore. So, and, and didn't get the TARP money, and didn't get the other kinds of benefits. But why don't we leave aside the question of whether or not there are long memories out there? Why don't we look at the fact that what we've got now is an interesting circumstance? You could not have identified the systemic risk that we were going to be encountering unless you look at it from a different perspective, which is the idea that you had a lot of people, many, many millions of people, not understanding some of the risks that they were incurring with regard to the mortgages that they were signing up for. And you had the ability to divorce that lack of understanding uh, in terms of the securitization of the marketplace. So what do you do? Uh, and some people have thought about different ways to handle that kind of systemic risk. One comes back to something mentioned yesterday, which is the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Agency, something that I think most people don't like because they see it as another regulator. But in fact, if you look at it not from the perspective of simply protecting consumers, but from the perspective of decreasing the opportunity for this kind of systemic risk to occur again, where you have millions of people all basically acting in the same way, and all heading for the exits or having uh, basically a problem all at the same time, if you can eliminate some of that by ensuring that people who were to buy these mortgages or buy credit card uh, or have credit cards that are too high or anything else in the future and put them in a position where in fact they know what the kinds of risks are that they're gonna be incurring, you might in fact decrease the number of people who take on that risk and if you decrease the number of those people who take on that risk, then you would start to have a way of controlling the potential for the systemic risk to grow in the society as a whole. That's one possibility. Uh, but what we won't be able to do, what none of us, I think, are smart enough to be able to do, and I agree with Professor Miller with the notion of intellectual hazard, I would just simply put it that we're just simply not smart enough. We can't discern these things well enough in advance to ever be able to ensure that they won't occur again. And in that case, I also agree with uh, Chairman um, and the sort of statements that were made earlier on uh, both parts of the panel that we will not be able to isolate in advance all the potential items that will come up. So how do we basically look at trying to make our regulators better? How do we try to come up with a system so that the regulatory structures can at least do better the job that they can do? And there I think we've got some obvious potential answers. And I agree with uh, the chairman that we're not in a position, shouldn't be in a position to simply add more regulatory agencies. We need to basically simplify the structure and to some degree, that goes back to Professor Miller's point, that we have too much complexity in the regulatory apparatus, which I don't think is a regulator's problem. I think it is a governmental problem writ large in that we have a lot of reasons why governments uh, and why Congress likes to have lots of regulatory agencies. We also have a lot of people who say that one of the things we need to make sure is that we have multiple voices, and we have lots of multiple voices. In the banking sector, we've got four different regulators, all of whom can speak, and some of whom speak very differently than others, uh, as we've seen with some of the issues between Schiller-Bear, for example, and Tim Geithner. Uh, 